Elaine, let's start with you, because we're in the middle of a presidential campaign where the, I mean, one of the chief, chief issues that people are talking about and that's affecting the campaign is the use of money and dark money for political advertising that are done by super PACs, 501c4s. Your idea, let's talk about what your idea was, was to kind of empower individuals to do some of the same things that, that those super PACs are doing. Is that right? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, so I was wandering around Chicago today, beautiful city, by the way, um, and I noticed what was striking is that the majority of the people I saw and heard probably have alternative points of view. And by that I mean that the way they would describe their lives is different from the way the mass media would describe their lives. The way that they would talk about an issue uh, that our country is facing. So for instance, um, how, how our society takes care of the poor and the sick. The way they talk about this is probably vastly different from the way our politicians talk about it, from the way the mass media talks about it. And so in reality, um, and this has only been enhanced by the super PACs, or you know, the Citizens United decision, but it's been true for a long time. Uh, the way we talk about political and social issues, the way we set our national agenda is set by a very small minority of people, um, which is crazy in this day and, day, this day and age. Uh, so what Social Teeth is really meant to do is you know, start from what's happening on the ground. Give everyday people access to the same airwaves that billionaires and super PACs have. But now, just to follow up on that, one of the things that's changed political advertising, and, and I've been covering politics for, you know, before there was television, I think, <laughs> um, is, is something like YouTube, right? So the campaign can produce an ad, put it up on YouTube, they don't spend any money to buy in local networks or cable channels, and it gets millions and millions of, of page views. I mean, isn't that a, a place where, that, that is a great leveler for people, that people can produce their own videos and put them on YouTube and compete with the Obama campaign or the Romney campaign? Yeah, in some ways it is a great leveler, um, but very few videos make it viral, and even fewer social and political serious videos make it viral. Um, you know, the, the idea of social teeth is to enhance what is happening in social networking. So, you know, there's a strong confirmation bias. If I make a video, my friends are very likely to see it. Maybe friends two or three degrees removed are likely to see it. Um, but unless it's hilarious or features, you know, a cat with its head in a milk carton or something, um, you know, it's unlikely to make it further than that. And so, you know, the idea is there are all these unsexy issues that we all care about. So every parent cares about nutrition and childhood obesity. They aren't necessarily going to, you know, enthusiastically post a video about nutrition on their Facebook wall. Um, but, you know, they might be very willing to support a PSA campaign about it. So, Aza, how did you get, because your background is really interesting and diverse, how did you end up focusing on healthcare as the place for for disruption and change, and, and talk about the way, what Massive Health really does. Sure. Uh, first, just want to say, awesome to be back in Chicago. My first two startups are here. In fact, the Argo T next to this theater was where four of us would go every single day. Uh, it was our, our fake office um, with a great barista. Um, so for me, I think for many entrepreneurs, in fact, where most disruption comes from is from passion and passion stories. Uh, each person has a passion. I think it's our moral obligation to use that passion to make the world a better place. And I, I feel very, very lucky as a, a 24, 25, 26 year old, I got to work with an amazing group of people at, at Mozilla to make Firefox, this product that went out to, to half a billion people. And that's a really heady thing, but then you get your quarter life crisis. What am I gonna do after this? <laughs> and you look around and there are two main problems I see facing the world. Um, that design can have an impact with. And those are education and healthcare. Um, and unlike you, I had no idea how to make money in education. Um, but in particular, there, there's some really scary things going on in, in healthcare. Um, I got to know this woman who had type 1 diabetes. And I'd never really dealt with that condition before. Um, and she, it took her like a month, two months to come out to me that she had, had this disease. And she'd prick her finger once, twice, no, 10 times every single day, and she'd write those numbers down in a logbook. 
And she couldn't answer a simple question. Despite the fact that these numbers determined whether she lived or died, she couldn't answer a question, am I doing better today than yesterday, this week than last week? And I still looked around, nobody had that. In fact, Walt Mossberg is type one diabetic. His state of the art is no better. And I think he famously said that if Steve Jobs saw sort of a, a glucose monitor, he would throw up on it. Um, so a little bit of design here can go a long, long way. Let me give an example. Um, how many of you, people probably don't really remember what a VCR is, but if you do, um, you'll remember that it's, okay, one, um, you'll remember that it's really hard to program them. Um, but whose fault is that? Is that your fault that you can't program them? Or is it the guy that designed it, or the girl? It's clearly the guy that designed it. So one out of five Americans doesn't finish their antibiotics course. And that's despite the literally hundreds of millions of dollars we've spent on PSA is trying to teach people that if you don't, you get and create super bugs. You don't get better. And yet still, one out of five people <coughs> don't take their antibiotics through to completion. So here's my question. Is that people's fault? Or is that the fault of the design of our intervention? If it was a path that you put on yourself and it just fell off at the right time, forgetting wouldn't even be a thing. The reason why we're going to end up, as the CDC predicts, with 52% obesity, or 52% uh, diabetes and prediabetes rate in just seven years by, by 2020 is because our interventions and our medical institution doesn't work the way people do. They work the way medicine has always worked. And that's the big disruption I see happening and why I switched to healthcare, because design and consumer is the only way that we can make medicine work the way people do, and that's the only way that we as a nation can get better. But how did medicine become so backward? I mean, why, why are doctors still writing things down on clipboards? And, and it just seems that, that th this idea that, that we, every time we go to a doctor or a hospital, we have to say, fill in a form that says, uh, you know, I had measles and all of this. It's, it's in this day and age, if we're thinking about the last panel, where Google wants to own your identity and know so much about you, how come the hospital knows nothing about you? So I, let me start with the scariest statistic I've ever learned about doctors, which is that you can predict what they're gonna prescribe to you based on the year they graduated from medical school. Yeah, exactly, it blew my mind. Um, and the reason why is, I went to University of Chicago, so I'm gonna get a little bit like metaphysical here, um, and, and quote uh, Thomas Kuhn in Structures of a Scientific Revolution. He said, uh, you really only get true paradigm shifts um, after the old people die. Mm -hmm. uh, because that's when you get the young people thinking this, in this new paradigm. Um, and in medicine, you look at how long it takes to go through that program. Of course, technology is gonna move very slowly. And then they are the most marketed at people on Earth. What is a little startup going to do? Um, it's because that system has ossified, in particular with the culture of being a doctor, of that authoritative pers perspective of the education, that means it's very, very hard for it to change. We have, I think, trickle-down medicine, um, which is to say, when a company comes out with a new service, they don't make it for a person. They make it for the insurance provider or for the doctor, and they hope that that ends up meaning people will be more well. And the only way we can then switch that around and end up making people better is by making products for them. And with the advent of the cell phone, as you guys were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, health happens in between doctor visits, that's where we get to people. This is the first time in history where we can change the conversation from one that is intermediated by your doctor and goes directly to a human. Uh, so Dan, I wanna get to Chegg in a second, but in your previous life, um, when you worked for Quadrangle, which we, it was an in investment firm, a private equity firm, right. you were looking at people who were disrupting businesses and trying to pick winners, right? I mean, you'd look at, at, at our, our two other panelists and say, hey, is that, a, is that a business I want to invest in or not? Would you invest in their businesses? <laughs> <laughs> well, I brought my checkbook. Okay. <laughs> That's what they wanted to hear. But, uh, but by the way, thank you for clearing it up because I grew up in the era of the VCR and I thought that the reason it just kept flashing 12 was my fault because I was Jewish. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
Yeah, the answer is it, it depends on valuation. But, um, but what, what I looked for in companies where, where I see the disruption going as a result of technology is probably, it's not talked about very much, but re what's really shifted is who the customer is. So the medical field, why did everything suck? It's because it was sold to the doctor and the doctor didn't have to use it. So why was political fundraising done the way it was done? It's because you can put the money to a politician or to a group and they had all the power. So what's happening with social and mobile and all of these things is that who creators of products and services need to sell to has changed. So, you know, if, if you look at all the companies that are successful, they're the ones who make the experience for the ultimate user easier, better, faster. And, you know, what I like is I, I have a, a two daughters, 19 and 17 year old uh, daughters who have never known a day without the internet, never known a day uh, without broadband, never known a day without the iPhone, even though it's five years old, never known a day without TiVo, wouldn't know what a VCR is, um, and don't even know what the mailbox is because the mailbox lives in their pocket. And so they, you know, they have a set of assumptions about how things should work as opposed to being obligated to go get it from Walmart. People thought Walmart had this amazing selection. They didn't. They just had more selection than the next guy, and then along came eBay, and then along came Search, and then along came Amazon. So I think that has been the, when I look for companies, it's companies that are platform companies. It's companies that are able to utilize uh, data to the advantage of the consumer, as opposed to necessarily just for the advantage of themselves. Um, for people who recognize that the end customer is the person that they're building the business for. And in, this, in these cases, that's really what they're doing. They're empowering people to make better decisions for themselves and ultimately, we will be more likely to use things intelligently or to have a voice if we felt empowered to do so and it was made easier. So talk about Chegg and, and as we've seen tonight, I mean, education is an area that is so ripe for disruption because it was so ossified and Chegg is actually getting over some of those traditional barriers that prevented students from, from achieving. Yeah, look, I, I go back to what I just said, which is we put the student first. So if you think about it, textbooks were written for professors to then assign to the class. So how to use it, what it contained, how much it cost, student had no say and had no choice because it was required. Um, you know, I heard um, uh, somebody mentioned earlier, maybe it was you or Steve, um, who mentioned that when you look at schools, schools today are still taught the same way today as they were 200 plus years ago. When I took my daughter to go look at schools, I, I love American history, I'm living the American dream. And um, you know, we went to UVA, it's one of the most gorgeous campuses on the planet, and we went to William and Mary, I'm like, Thomas Jefferson graduated here and built this. And they show you these rooms on the quad where the original people who built the school lived. And, and I'm thinking to myself, holy crap, they, are, they haven't changed anything. <laughs> it still doesn't even have running water. So, you know, you're, you're living in a world where um, the reason education didn't scale is because there was too much money in protecting the past. Mm -hmm. And so today, when the economy is terrible and job search is terrible and salaries are dropping, smart kids, and they're smart, and I don't care if they've gone, gone to Harvard, which is magnificent, or the university if you've never heard of me, right? These kids are smart, they're aggressive, they're trying very hard to be productive citizens and contributors to this economy. And so what we've decided to do is make it easier, cheaper. Our mission is to save them time, save them money, and get them smarter. And we don't have to own all the products. So we took the risk, we raised several hundred million dollars, we bought textbooks, we figured out how to get around the when are they gonna go out of print, which is a gimmick in and of itself. Um, and so we made the investment, and so now a $200 textbook, a student can rent for 40 bucks. That's allowed them to take more classes. You know, the fact that, that there are, you know, that in state schools, and 80% of the kids in the country go to state schools, it's, the, the cost of textbooks is 25% of the cost of tuition. That's insane. But more importantly, the fact is, 
you know, we, you mentioned it earlier that, you know, certain groups have to die off. I wouldn't be that aggressive, but what I would have to say is the best thing we could do for educators is educate them on technology. Educate them how to use it, educate them what it does well, what it doesn't do well, because every student that comes into these colleges now is more equipped, more capable, more aware of technology than anybody that's teaching them. And so if you look at a company like Chegg, which most of you have probably never heard of, we have 30% of all college kids use something in our network. In a given day, 75,000 students a day are using a version of homework help that we've created for them. Not because they want to cheat, but because they want to master the concept. And office hours don't work for a kid who's got to have two jobs to pay off their student loan when they're at school. So, you know, from my perspective, what we're really doing is focusing on students trying to make their life easier, saving time, saving money, get smarter. We started with textbooks, now we help them get into college, help them pick their classes, help them get scholarships, help them get class notes. We connect with student to student, student to educator. So we're utilizing mobile, social, all of these things, but we focus on the end result, which is the student. So in fact, I mean, you sort of crystallized this. The, the theme, in a way, of what all of you are doing is about using technology to empower the individual. That you know, traditionally in, all, in, in, in politics, in healthcare, and education, the institution had more power than, than the individual. Right. Technology is giving much more power to the individual now, and these old institutions, which are often very protective of the past, are having to adjust. I mean, one of the things, Elaine, that I always think about politics is, is that they're ripe for disruption. I mean, in terms of another thing that Benjamin Franklin would recognize when he came back is the way we vote. Like, there's this particular day. And on that day, we all go and, and you know, pull a lever or do something <laughs> like that. I mean, it's really, really old-fashioned and, and gets in the way of democracy. I mean, so it seems to me what, one of your goals is to actually make the process more democratic with a small d. Yeah, I mean... Um... There's no question there. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> do, can I answer? You can go fine. <laughs> Um, voting is important. I do it every, every chance there is to vote. Um, I have to admit, it's a little anticlimactic um, because you're choosing bundles of issues and so many elections boil down to you know, the lesser of two evils, which, which is crazy. Um, and so, yeah, what I'm trying to do is give people a higher level of granularity in their involvement with politics. And so, so how many people have like opted in and uploaded things or made their own kind of ads? How, how has that worked? Yeah, so we had um, a launch contest where different organizations could just submit their videos. Um, I think we got about 30. And then we just did a mass voting process and narrowed it down to the top five. Um, so maybe 3,000 people voted for that contest. And, no, but, and none of them are secretly working for campaigns and, and uh, uploading. Oh, who knows? <laughs> so, Asa, how did you, because um, the, the other stuff you've done, I mean, you've been in the music business. I, I'd love you to talk a little bit about that, because you've been a kind of a serial startup guy. Um, and again, that's what, in a way, is, is what the kind of modern renaissance man is, right? You kind of, you, you, you look at different areas, and how to change them. So talk a little bit about, about some of the other things you've done. Sure, so uh, before I was at Mozilla, I did something called Songza, which uh, still exists. You can tell that I named it really late at night because it was the word song and then the last half of my first name. Um, it's still a terrible name. Um, but it still exists. Uh, and I learned an important lesson, which is never go into music because it, it sucks. Um, you think you're going to be spending all of your time doing music and Instead, you spend all of your time dealing with record labels. Um, for me, though, uh, one of the things I, I was really interested in after college is where do great ideas come from? And that question is, is haunting, because is it the product of the times? Is it the people that you're around? Um, and one of the things that I came to realize is that great ideas, brilliant ideas, are almost always obvious in hindsight. That is to say, once you've given that kernel of, of truth, you're like, of course, I should have thought of that. And the way that you come up 
with great ideas, therefore, is to find things which are obvious. And how do you find things which are obvious? How do you make the non-obvious obvious? Metaphor. This is, we do this all the time in the investing world, in the startup world. It's, this is X but for Y. Chegg is Netflix but for textbooks, at least at the beginning. So I think to be an entrepreneur, to look for disruption, is to immerse yourself in as many disparate fields as possible um, so that you can have metaphors across them. IDEO calls them T-shaped people, people that are deep in at least one thing and broad in many. Because if you can do that, then things that were hard become very easy. And so I find myself using the math and physics that I had all the time in help because we're doing new styles of really large data analysis. Um, an example of this is we, we, one of our products, the eatery, um, has 10 million uh, different food ratings in its database of people that have eaten something. Um, and with it, we're able to show that for every hour of the day that passes, people eat 1.7% less well. That means breakfast is the most healthy, dinner is the least healthy, late night binge drinking, of course, is less healthy than that. Um, but that 1.7%, is linear, it's true all the way across. So that means very simply, if you're trying to decide between eating lunch now at noon or at two, um, you're gonna eat on average 4% worse at two. And that's true in San Francisco, it's true in Sao Paulo, it's true in Tokyo. This is something universal about how people make decisions in general and decisions about food in particular. And you only get there by starting to combine consumer scale, by large scale data analysis, you only get there when you start combining these different fields, which is why I think metaphor is so empower, important and empowering. Now, I'm gonna disrupt a little something myself because we're basically out of time, but we, so we didn't budget enough time for this. So but what I'd love to do, starting with Dan, is each of you talk about the following. So to disrupt, we're, we're talking about, we're always talking about new technology, but to disrupt means to do something to existing technology, existing verities, institutions, what I'd love to know is, for each of you, what's, been the, what's the biggest obstacle to a successful disruption? So in the creation of Chegg, what, is, what are the forces, the forces that are attempting to hold you back? Lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that universally true? I, Yes. Um, I mean, the sad so, thing about lawyers is that two well, people give the other 98 a bad name. Yeah, no, I, I think, look, it, it's, lawyers are, are, are more sort of a, a, a metaphor, if you will, at, for stopping progress. So, for example, in the business world, it, it was very funny. I had a great boss, Terry Summel, who I adore, ran Hollywood for 26 years. Um, uh, with all respect to what Kara said, who I really adore. Um, Yahoo is savable, and when I was there, I worked for Terry, and we took the company, we turned it around, um, and had great success. But Terry used to say the difference between Silicon Valley and Hollywood was in Hollywood, the first person, uh, if, whenever there was a new idea, the first person in the room they'd send to meet with you was the lawyer. And in Silicon Valley, the last person hired on a management team is the general counsel. And it's because if you actually listen to people who are trying to help you understand what rules have been created to protect the status quo, mm -hmm. you will never go past the status quo. And you know, Mike Moritz, who's a phenomenal investor from Sequoia, legendary, right? Only guy on Google and Yahoo's board. He'd say, if we worried about what big companies can do to us, we'd never invest in anything. And so from, so I, I mean it in a serious way, which is what I love, when, when I got turned on to the internet is when I went, Jerry Yang and David Philo and Jeff Mallett, when I was, uh, publishing computer magazines back in the, in, in the earlier days. And the difference was when I got a job, I said, had it, who had it before me? Why don't they have it anymore? And how can I do it 10% better? These guys would come in and said, I don't really give a shit about how anybody did it. What needs to be done and what's the simplest way to do it? Mm -hmm. And they didn't worry about laws, right? It, it's YouTube took off because they used the illegal content from Saturday Night Live and the thing blew through the roof. All the music companies, same thing. And so I, it, it's, the more we look backwards at rules that were set up in the past that protect what was, the less likely we are to be successful. 
And, um, and so that, that's my view on it. Mm -hmm. And so what's the biggest obstacle in front of you in Massive Health? I mean, in a very similar answer, um, a little flippantly doctors, but that's not exactly true because there are a lot of doctors there that are incredibly passionate about helping their, their patients get better. Um, but we do get a lot of pushback uh, from this idea that we, as a young company, can have any say in helping people that are, that are truly sick. So I was uh, giving another panel a uh, week and a half ago, um, and I was talking in particular about diabetes. Massive Health actually got its start by focusing really tightly on, on diabetes, and this woman got up um, and essentially lambasted me, saying, how dare you sort of approach our disease? Um, sort of talking about it, you're not part of our community, um, you're not part of the doctor community, you have incredible hubris to come up here and, and say things about us. And it's actually true, to be a startup person, you have to, I think, in a very humble way, have an incredible amount of hubris. You're trying to do something, by definition, unreasonable and impossible. Um, so overcoming those empathy gaps, and those empathy boundaries, so that you're not considered other, um, you're not scary yet, um, even though you're about to sort of eat like these people's lunch, uh, not, not the, the people with disease, but like the, the major uh, <laughs> pharmaceuticals and that, that kind of thing. Um, sidling up at the side and be able to, to know their problems, help them out, while at the same time knowing where you're going, those are generally the hardest problems that we've had to solve, um, both to patient communities, both to doctors and to insurance companies. Elaine, who doesn't want you to be in business? <laughs> Um, I don't know that we've gotten to the point where we really have people wanting to discourage us. Um, so I'd say two things. One is obscurity, and the other thing is just the, the complete unsavoriness of the subject matter. People have sort of um, turned off at the, at the word politics or at the mention of political ads. Um, people know that they're not interested. And, and so we're really trying to, to play with expectations there. Well, I think all three of you are a great advertisement for disruption and making the world and the nation a better place. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you.